And hello again, everyone, and welcome to Night's Report, presented by NV Energy. Delighted to have you with us here as we continue with our quarantine. Dave Gosher, Darren Elliott, Mike McKenna, Stormy Bond, and Tony, all present and accounted for. And we have a special guest here on this edition of Night's Report, Mayor Deborah March from the city of Henderson. Mayor, great to have you with us. And I wanted to start it off with what everyone seems to ask these days. What have you been doing for the last six weeks? Oh, we've been staying safe here in the city of Henderson. It's, uh, this has been an exciting time for our community, for everyone across the community. And we've just been working hard to make sure that all the needs of our residents are being addressed. When it comes to the construction here of Lifeguard Arena, I know you get to, to check it from your window, uh, the progress each and every day. Uh, I'm out here uh, today, actually, uh, in, in the construction truck. G give us your, your view of, of what the uh, progress has been with, with the construction. It's been pretty remarkable. Right outside my window is the, the <laughs> facility going up, the Lifeguard Arena. And um, right now they're putting the roof on, which is exciting to watch. And the, the side walls have gone up. And um, it's truly amazing to see the work that gets done and how quickly they do it. I, when they brought in the structural steel, I was amazed at how, how careful they were to place those uh, pieces of metal that they, they made it look like it was a feather and it was a huge piece of steel. You can start seeing that the building take shape and, and, and really it, it's the kind of the centerpiece of, of the Water Street District. Um, t talk about why, why that's important to have an anchor like this, a, a jewel to, to build around? You know, truly Lifeguard Arena is a game changer for Water Street. It's done so much to stimulate other investment on, on this street and other developers are looking to bring projects in and to to uh, bring jobs and opportunities. And, uh, you know, we, we for years have been working on redevelopment here on the Water Street District, but to have a project of this magnitude come in and create, they're creating 140 jobs and uh, creating some economic stimulus, but then, then they're gonna be attracting a lot of folks uh, coming here as well as bringing an AHL team to our community. The excitement, Mayor, of having an American Hockey League team uh, in your city. It's amazing the growth here from the Golden Knights coming, you know, three years ago and, and all the incredible passion that people have for the team. What's the excitement been like and the anticipation been like in your city to have an AHL franchise? Oh, we're thrilled. And, you know, we're, we're also extremely thrilled with the commitment by Bill Foley and the Vegas Golden Knights and their commitment to a partnership with the city of Henderson to do some amazing things and to uh, bring these this project and other projects to our community and to ensure that we do have an AHL team. And probably the only thing that would be more exciting for me would be to know the name of the team. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, speaking of names, Mayor, something that I thought was pretty significant was having the name Henderson be in the official name and be in the building. Maybe how proud does that make you and the residents? And what was your reaction when you found that out? Well, when, when uh, Bill Foley announced that, we were just so thrilled. I mean, he uh, is committed to our community and the Golden Knights have been committed to our community, have worked very hard and closely with us on the lifeguard arena and in conversations to do more in our community, to have a place for, for the team to be able to play as well. Mayor March, I absolutely love your background, having the Golden Knights jersey. Uh, and I, I had to fake mine. You know, I've, I've got the, uh, the motif of T-Mobile behind me here. Yours is way, way better. But I'm curious about uh, the Henderson Event Center and the Pavilion site. Why that location? What's going to make that work uh, for the team coming in and for all the events that will be taking place in Henderson? You know, the, the event center is very central to Henderson and it's in a great location along the 215 at Green Valley Parkway. It, it's near retail. It's uh, just a very good central location. And I think that there was survey work that was done that uh, said that that was probably the most appropriate place to, to place that facility. Um, also, we did some uh, outreach. We did survey work. We uh, talked to the community. We had a company, uh, Discovery Nevada, do some survey work. And the, the community is, 71% of the community is excited about having an AHL team coming to the community of Henderson, but also 71% of the community is thrilled about the idea of having that event center um, at Green Valley Parkway and uh, the 215. So uh, we, we've been listening to the community and we're excited about this 
partnership with the Golden Knights. What is that event center, Mayor, going to mean to your city and also to your community on a, on a daily basis? What sorts of benefits will you derive from that? Well, it is a community event center, so it'll be a place where the community can come together for special events, for concerts and plays and special performances. Um, I regularly hear from the, the colleges and from high schools that they need a place to host their graduations or to have special events for the schools. This will be a place where those activities can occur as well. And then of course the, the Henderson Symphony Orchestra has needed a home and they've played outdoors when the pavilion was open and um, if the weather was bad, it was uh, not temperature controlled. So you could either have very bad weather or very hot weather. You could have rain. Uh, there was no way of controlling the environment and having a closed environment uh, with four walls will certainly create a, a much more climate controlled, temperature controlled environment for things to happen. And on top of that, then having uh, the partnership with the Knights to, to provide hockey, I think 30, four nights a year, I think is when uh, we're looking at uh, using that for hockey, is uh, 34 nights for that partnership as well. And we're more, when they, more when they make the playoffs. I, I'm the hockey guy, so I'm gonna ask you, how can, how, can the hockey, how can the hockey fans help support the project? Well, I just think to, to come out, let us know that you're supportive of it. We, again, we did survey work. We heard that 71% of the community is supportive. Uh, you know, if there are folks out there that would like to express their support and, and enthusiasm for the project, please let us know. Please reach me. Uh, Mayor March, being an ex-player myself and spending a lot of time in the American Hockey League, I can say firsthand that it's a very community-driven league. The players are constantly out, uh, whether it's in schools or doing functions in the community. So. Can you maybe talk a little bit to the level of excitement that the Henderson community has for the players being accessible and being out into the community? You know, I think it really does make a difference. In fact, uh, through this COVID-19 uh, effort, we've seen players come out and speak uh, about issues relative to making safe decisions. And so having that kind of support from team members and being a part of the community, being a part of the fabric of the community, uh, being a family member, bringing their families and being part of a neighborhood really does make a difference. These are young, healthy, wholesome uh, individuals who, who really are parts of our family. They become a part of our family in our community as well. When, when you think about support, I, I'm curious what your view is on the relationship between Henderson and the Golden Knights, maybe now and, and moving forward in this new exciting chapter. How do you view that relationship? Oh, I think it will only strengthen. You know, we, we've got a great relationship with uh, Mr. Foley and with Carrie Bubols, and um, we have had a lot of folks coming over to our city from the Golden Knights and certainly being a part of our community and caring about what's happening in our community and paying attention to the things that are happening here. And we appreciate that. We appreciate that they're part of us. They're, they're part of Henderson. Mayor, how often are you over at the construction site? I know you can see it out your window. Do you put the hard hat on? What's that look like? I haven't been down on the site, but I, I think I better get down there. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I'm there every day. <laughs> you like the ceremonial groundbreaking shovel. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. We had the sledgehammers when we knocked down the uh, convention center. And there this is truly a, a remarkable addition to our community down below. Yeah, well, it must be incredible for you too, Mayor, to see the, this growth. And as I said, it's only been really three years since the Golden Knights, less than that, really, when you think about it, the Golden Knights didn't play a game until October of, of 2017. Um, what's it been for you to witness this, the popularity of the Golden Knights, and now here we are, you know, with an AHL franchise for, for Henderson on the horizon? How amazing is that? I mean, to have our own AHL team here in the city of Henderson, we, we just can't wait until the team arrives in our community. And, and uh, certainly the relationship with the Golden Knights is second to none. Well, I, I better be careful about saying that because I also have the, the Raiders helmet. <laughs> 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 there are practice facilities in Henderson too. It is, it, it is in Henderson and you know we've been am amazed when you think back probably five years ago we would never have imagined that we would be a sports 
uh, supporting community. And now we have the practice field for the Raiders and now the lifeguard arena where the, it's the home of the AHL team, the Henderson AHL That's team. That's right. And certainly looking at uh, a place for them to play uh, on a regular basis. Well, Mayor March, it's wonderful to have you take some time out of your day. Uh, thank you for joining us. Please stay safe. And uh, yeah, we can't wait to, uh, to see AHL games in Henderson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great to have Mayor Deborah March from the city of Henderson join us here on Night's Report presented by our friends at NV Energy. You know, Darren and Mike uh, and myself all spent significant time in the AHL and Stormy, a Vegas native, and, and now working for a hometown team. And there's going to be a team in Henderson here in the not too distant future. I guess, Mike, maybe I'd, I'd start with you just you know, that time in the AHL and, you know, I, I remember my time there, that those are special, can be real special moments, the time together, the camaraderie, the closeness of everybody. Uh, how would you kind of encapsulate what your time was like? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of different ingredients that go into being part of the American Hockey League. You're learning how to be a professional first off. Second, you have to live on your own. That's new to a lot of players coming out of junior or college. So there's a lot of growing up that happens and it's in a very accelerated time frame. Because if you're trying to get to the NHL, you've got that two, three-year window usually that you spend as a prospect trying to make it. So I, I can think of my first couple of years in the American Hockey League and how much I grew up and learned about myself, about hockey, about everything in life that made me who I was today. And, you know, it, it was a constant battle every day to try to get better, to move on to the next level. So it was a really stressful uh, league in some ways in that you had to perform and it's very competitive, which is what drives players. Uh, and on top of that, you know, as I got older and played as an older player, you take on a mentor role and there's all these different elements to it that make it interesting. Um, but you know, Darren, you're seeing, are seeing it firsthand now with your son, Mitch playing in Utica, how imagine how much your son has seen and changed and grown up in even this last year. Yeah, it's uh, from a hockey standpoint, from, a, as you said, from you know, becoming a, a young adult, all those kinds of things that go into that. Um, it, it's interesting for me because I spent a lot of time in the American Hockey League and, it, you know, the, the early to mid 80s. And, you know, to see the growth, to see the, the opportunity to have an AHL team in Vegas with an NHL team in the same market, but being treated first class from that standpoint, we're going to have your own facility to play the games just like the the golden knights do the, the, you know city national arena is, is home base and they only perform at, at their venue uh, on game night to, to, ha to see it go like that from where i broke in with the la kings we shared a team in new haven uh, connecticut with the rangers so who do you think had most input geographically so just think about our farm the the ahl team was you couldn't be any further away from Los Angeles. So, you know, in, in terms of the economics and, and the development thought process from the NHL to the AHL, it, it has come so far and it's great to see it. And my son, like I said, uh, Mitch is, is experiencing some of that. Darren, I was going to ask you what it was like to play in the American League in the 60s, but you're saying the 80s, so that's fine. Uh, <laughs> well, what well, it looked like it was the 60s. <laughs> no, no, I was there in the 90s, so I'm not too far behind you. But anyways, what was it like, though? What, you know, what do you, when you think about those days, what jumps into your memory? Well, there's, there's the, the, my first reaction, there's a couple things. I, I came right out of the 84 Olympics, uh, having competed with Team Canada, and I finished the season um, so you come in as the kid and you're, you're taking somebody's job right off the bat for the last two months. Uh, that year, uh, LA was 21st in the National Hockey League, and there were only 21 teams, and 21st in the American Hockey League. So there was no, no playoffs. So I got into six games. Then I made the LA Kings, and then it was kind of an up and down situation for three years. And on the back side of that, I got traded to Detroit and spent most of the season uh, as the emergency guy, like the, like the the depth guy. Um, it was my one of my obviously playing your first NHL game and, and making the NHL is is your dream. But if I had to be honest about my most rewarding season as a pro, it was probably playing for the Adirondack Red Wings uh, and their AHL team with Bill Deneen as the coach. We had so many veteran American League players, guys who were just lifers in that league, and half the team was trying to make it, as Mike mentioned. And and that dynamic 
uh, and the success we had and the camaraderie built, um, and you're tied back to a, a, a icon like, like, like Bill Deneen, it, it's like, it, it just spans generations all on one team. Um, so I said that was rewarding. Early on though, I, I did find out from that standpoint, I wish I would have been, in the, you don't want to be in the American League. Let's, let's start right there, right? You want to be in the NHL. But my fourth year pro, I'm like, you know, I probably could have used a couple of years here first instead of trying to establish your game at the NHL level. And when you had a downturn, you'd had nothing really to fall back on yet because you hadn't established it as an NHLer. So it's a very vital step and one that most players make nowadays. How nice is it to have that vital step here in Las Vegas and Henderson, having them so close? You know, to be able to have the facility and access so close to where the NHL team is, because I keep on thinking about how right now the team is in Chicago and how tough that was on a guy like Nick Waugh making those constant trips back yeah. and forth and Nick Haig and all those guys. Well, it speaks to how much the league has changed, too. That's right. So first off, it's amazing to have – your affiliate in your own local community. And most teams have now gone to where uh, they'll have their affiliate somewhere between one and three hours away, seems normal. Uh, but a couple of them have them in house, like we're gonna have with Vegas now and Henderson being 40 minutes away. It's paramount. You have the ability to see your own prospects way more often in your own building. You can monitor their development. Call-ups are much easier, as you alluded to with Nick Waugh. And it just makes things simpler. And the league has changed and, and and grown so much even since I started playing uh, and finished playing. That was a 14-year span in that league. It was you regional know, when I first started. Yeah, you know, that's I mean, right. Dave, Dave, you were in Providence, right? Yeah. And it was basically a bus league, and you never went more than 8 or 12 hours away. You may fly once a year if you're lucky. Now the western half of the league flies all over. You've got a team in Texas, team in Chicago, team in Vegas, California teams. That, that has largely been become a bus league but they still compete regionally but you don't do. have crossover right. from east to west you know so, as, so that's different right. um and what you mentioned though having this is the ideal situation to have them right in your own market yeah. um some of the teams that have done that have them actually play in the building and i don't think that you know san jose has done that and you get nobody oh it's there. it's dreadful there's right. no you're so, playing in front of friends and family in that building right so so this makes it local um, the development process, as you guys alluded to, uh, is much better, but you still get called up. It, yeah. You're still going to the big rink. There's, you're not just an afterthought in the big rink while you're right. putting in your time in the American League. Big difference, I think. There's still the carrot at the end of the stick. <laughs> you're not in the same building, but you're yep. so close that you can taste it, and it's so easy, so much easier. And from a player perspective, you only have to live in one place. You only have to take right. up residence. So if you're called yeah. up, you get to stay in the same place. It's so beneficial and to, to be able to have that. Think about playing in New Haven versus L.A. You know, you get called up to L.A. like oh. you were talking about, Darren. Well. If you had been living in New Haven, you'd leave all your possessions, your residence, hotel well, I have, life. I have a good story about that. So they traded for Roly Melanson. I get sent down. It's my third year. I've had a, an apartment. They say, no, we've made the commitment. All your stuff. So my car, all my possessions on the way to New Haven. I get to New Haven first, obviously. Roly Melanson plays one game, tears his groin. I've got to go back to L.A. for the rest of the season and live uh, in an embassy suites. I've when done I, similar things. I, the yeah. last, you know, less than a week, in five days. And then I had to go back to New Haven after the uh, NHL season, get all my stuff, and, and drive home. So, yeah, less than ideal. <laughs> they didn't care about stuff like that, that's for sure. You mentioned Adirondack, and I just want to know how many drinks my father-in-law served you at Talk of the Town. My, my in-laws are from Adirondack. <laughs> they had season tickets, uh, and oh. the Deneen family's legendary. Yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, Stormy, can you believe this, though, that – this is Vegas having an American League and NHL team. When I was there with the Wranglers, it was just ECHL. It's grown yeah. up so much since we've been there. No, I think about that all the time just because, like, we were talking to Gage Quinney last week and reminiscing on how there were just two rinks here when I was growing up. And I'm just 27 years old. You know, it's not like I've lived here for 40 years and, oh, there was this in the 80s and stuff. But, like, just oh, thinking about how Back in the Stone Age. <laughs> you know what I mean? every time I bring out my age I just make everybody mad at me I'm sorry no, that's good no. um, <laughs> we've got no, a nice spectrum I, I really, on this call I really do think about that all the time though how you know hockey's come and go in this community and it's never really stuck 
And now there is accessible, pristine ice rinks for people to be able to come to. And there are club teams and there are high school teams and there are just things that I've never seen before. And it's, it's just really, really cool. And something that I, I know that I never, ever would have expected growing up learning how to skate at the Santa Fe Hotel and Casino. <laughs> like, it's just, it's not something I would have expected. Well, a couple of uh, points, guys. You mentioned, Mike, about the, the dangling of the carrot, right? That carrot was never closer than back in the day when the Philadelphia Flyers played at the big rink and the Phantoms played literally across right. the parking lot of the That's Ocean. right. Yeah. You got called up. You walked across the parking lot. It doesn't get much closer than that. So. That was my first American League hockey yeah. ga- American Hockey League game was in the old spectrum Fantastic. against the, uh, f- uh, the Philadelphia Phantoms, and we won in a shootout against Jamie Storr. I'll never forget it. Yeah. First game was right there in the old building. The other thing I remember from my days in Providence is, you know, Providence is only about 45 miles south of Boston, and, you know, you could get called up that morning and drive up 95 – and be in Boston, barring traffic, it could take you 45 minutes or three days, but you know what I mean. So the proximity of that, but also think about Kelly McCrimmon and, and George McPhee. Henderson's playing a game on a Friday night. Drive over to Henderson, see some of your top prospects, as opposed to having to, you know, potentially travel elsewhere to do it. It's, the convenience of it is really beyond belief. It's going to be fantastic when this gets going in the fall. Yeah. Skill training, the stuff that Mike talked about, nutrition, all those kinds of elements. You're the AHL team, but now you really have NHL oversight right in your own market. It, it's uh, it's just that next level of, of, of detail that will really help all the players in the organization. Yeah, and, and Dave, you know, you mentioned your, uh, your time in Providence. There's no closer relationship, really, when you look at – us versus Hen- us and Henderson versus Providence and Boston, that similarity, it, yeah. it's very close. And, you know, for goaltenders, for players, skill development, goalie coaching, you can keep an awful lot of things in house and it just, it just simplifies it for the whole organization. All right, Stormy. Uh, what did you fire up here for the rapid fire situation? <laughs> What's going on? Well, well, just before I do officially start the rapid fire, okay. I want to tell Darren, I don't think we gave enough credit to him being in like the truck right now <laughs> on site. You're in a truck? It's like, what's around you? <laughs> the like, trailer. The trailer, man. In the trailer on site. Like, we just over, we skipped right over that at the beginning. And I just, I'm curious, like, what are, what's in there? What are you doing in there? Why aren't you wearing a hard hat? <laughs> no, that's only out on the job. So I've got my hard hat and then, and, and my, uh, you know, my vest to make sure I can be seen and not run over by uh, a forklift. Um, but now I've got an office full of, you know, samples, flooring samples, paint samples, uh, out in the main office is uh, all, all the uh, all the drawings, uh, you know, all the blueprints, and the, it's uh, you go through each of the sheets, whatever guys are working on. It's amazing how much stuff, uh, as the mayor was talking about, how quickly things go up. Once they do all the underground, you know, electrical and plumbing, and mechanical work, and, and start pouring the slabs, all of a sudden it's like you're back when you're a, a, a little kid. The erector set or Lego. It just goes up like that. Everything comes in prefabbed, and it's just like, okay, put this here, bolt it together, here we go next. It's amazing to watch it go up. Um, and, and now it does start to – you can tell that it's going to be a rink. Uh, a week from now, real exciting because they put in, the, uh, they put in the, the, the pads for the ice, and that's a process that uh, I still get excited about. <laughs> That's it looks nice. cool. As trailers go, it does look nice. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 uh, spacious. it's a double wide. Yeah, you like my backdrop. I, I didn't have time. I had to go get uh, uh, some uh, earphones for, for Melissa's direction, and uh, so I didn't have time to get uh, a, a fake backdrop uh, posted. But next time. <laughs> we'll send a couple no, posters perfect. you can put in the background. Maybe a tapestry. It was, it was perfect for the subject matter. Okay, guys, my go. question for you today, right. and I think I might already know Dave Gosher's answer. But if there was one food item or condiment that you could remove from the earth, what would it be? Uh, I'll start. I'll, I'll, I'll give you. Use. I'll give you. Uh, boy, because I have a hat trick, right? Mustard mayo. <laughs> yeah, and I know blue at cheese. least two of them. Mustard okay, mayo, mustard blue, blue cheese. cheese. It's a hat trick. Yeah, yeah, it's the hat trick. So I can't do it. So I've never had a hot dog with mustard or a burger with mustard or a sandwich with mayonnaise. Let me, let me modify the mayonnaise thing. You know how you play like playing these golf tournaments and stuff and they give you the box lunch. Mm-hmm. I always open the sandwich to see if there's mayonnaise on the turkey and cheese for sake of argument. If there's mayonnaise <laughs> on there, it's trash can. 
There you go. I've never seen anyone more upset at like a pregame media <laughs> meal than Dave Gosher when it's the buffalo wings with the blue cheese crumble and um, the wedge salad. Like, mm-hmm. that is the most upset Dave Gosher is at a pregame Ruined meal I've ever seen. Night. Oh, I remember preseason, we had a meme float around with Dave upset about the blue cheese. <laughs> I think it was in San Jose. I'm with you, Dave. I don't like blue cheese either. I really don't. I do. I love blue cheese. Sorry. Oh, very strange. Well, well you're in business. Three. Yeah. Darren, you're in business if, you're, if your son's in Utica that if you're close enough, Western New York is blue cheese central. Maybe that's why I spent a lot of time there. Like you said, Glens Falls, New York. Yeah. And uh, Rochester played for the Americans. So maybe it was the upstate. Maybe I didn't even know why I liked it, just because I spent so much time in upstate New York. Wow. One food item. This is really hard to pick, Stormy. I don't, what's yours? You like a lot of food. See, I don't, I dislike a lot of food. <laughs> so for me, <laughs> it was, I've always been just like a very basic eater and I don't do well with a lot of things. But I think that my thing I would for sure just like, I can't handle is mushrooms. I don't like them on anything. The umami. And it grew, like, oh. Oh. No. Like even the oh. the and it's not just a texture thing. Like it's a texture, it's a taste. Like mushrooms, olives, um, any of that kind of. Ugh. No, can't do it. But I also don't eat like I don't eat sushi. I don't eat a lot of fish. I don't eat like a lot of things. I'm sorry. I saw you. I saw you preparing sushi. Nice effort. It's your an oh, the, that was I, <laughs> that was an interesting experience for me. There was one thing I ended up really liking though. It was like a lobster something wrapped in egg. But Tomas Nosek, when we did that sushi wrapping thing together, like he was giving me grief the whole time about it. He was like, "You don't eat sushi, do you?" I can tell you picked up the sticks upside down. You know what? I'm not big on anise, like the licorice flavor, black licorice flavor. That's not really my. Oh, thing. I like. See, and I like that. Yeah. Uh, for like me, black licorice uh, jelly beans. I, I, so everything you guys hate, I like. So, um, but mine, I, I, I'm pretty open ended on. For whatever reason, I, I don't like cucumbers. What? That's such a basic thing. <laughs> I know. I, I'm trying to think of stuff. It's like, but I love pickles, so I'll just leave it at that. I don't know, and so I can't cut it out because I can't get the pickles if we cut out cucumbers. So I, I'm, I'm trapped. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I'll give you one little, before we wrap it up, Darren, one little offshoot of that. So I can't stand mayonnaise. Yeah. I don't mind ranch or Caesar dressing. I don't know why. Yeah, exactly. I don't know why. What do, you think of people that, what do you think of people that, oh, tomatoes are another one for me. And I'm, the, I ask this question because I think of tomatoes, like, I hate tomatoes, but I love ketchup. I love marinara sauce. I love stuff like that. Is is that normal, or is there something? Well, wrong with they're di- they're completely different because those have lots of sugar in them. Most of them, yeah. There you go. Tomatoes. <laughs> see, as it you cook tomatoes, sense. if you cook them down, they they become sweet. Uh, they release their natural. Uh, it, it's a whole process. I'm oh, actually the same oh. way. I don't really like raw tomatoes that much, but I use them all the time and I cook with them. Oh, Just you like anything, Mike? Did you pick well, anything? I don't like blue cheese. I really don't. And, and to be honest with you, Nobody I'm not. Likes blue cheese. People will call me a people like to call me a foodie, and I think first it's a pretentious term, so I'm not big on it. But I also don't think I fit that category because I don't really like charcuterie or cheese all that much. Like I like cheese as an ingredient, and if it melts, but just cheese on its own, is my life. I can't just like go eat cheese, like cheese. And crackers. <laughs> it's not my thing. I, I just cheese. go to the Except refrigerator and like grab a piece of American cheese, grab a piece of Swiss, grab a piece of provolone. Like I'll eat cheese all day. You know what my daughter calls uh, American cheese? She calls it flat cheese. Flat cheese. It's just a little square. So when she was like three years old, she started calling it flat cheese. <laughs> That's She's cute. Not wrong. I love She's it. Not wrong. Uh, That's what right. kids come up with. It. I remember what uh, our youngest daughter when she was three years old. Relish is her pickle jam. That's it's like the perfect name for it. And then yeah. like. Where'd that come from? <laughs> That's fantastic. Good question, Stormy. Real good question. Well done. As always. Send you over some blue cheese, mustard, and mayo when we're done here. I'm going to dig up that meme of Dave and the yeah, blue cheese. I forgot about that. That's hilarious. I'll remember that. You'll that have, yeah, great. pass it along. That great. Well, guys, thanks for this. It's been a lot of fun. And again, our thanks to Henderson Mayor Deborah March as well. A lot of excitement, obviously, in the city of Henderson with the AHL starting there coming up in the fall. Thanks for tuning in.
to this edition of Knight's Report presented by NV Energy. We'll talk to you next time.